indiscipline, corruption, squandered mania, misuse and abuse of public office for self or group aggrandizement, which had assumed debilitating proportions in the last few years, will be dealt with ruthlessly, no matter whoever may be involved. In the early hours of December 31st, 1983, a well-organized military coup under the leadership of Major General Buhari took place in Nigeria. It was not unwelcome by most of our people, and it was not unexpected. Our economy was in a mess, and yet we are not only the biggest country in black Africa, we are, or should be, one of the richest. <laughs> My name is Onyeka Onwenu. A few weeks before the coup, the BBC and Nigerian television asked me to report as a Nigerian television journalist on the situation in my country. Recently, like many Nigerians, I've felt frustrated and saddened by what has happened to us. We've had our independence for more than 20 years. By third world standards, we have a well-educated elite. We had a productive farming economy. We have minerals, and we discovered a few years ago that we had oil, a lot of oil. Yet today we are importing food that we should be growing. We are a bankrupt nation, and we have an international reputation for large-scale corruption. Many of our people are unhappy, and some even hungry. What has gone wrong? This is what I set out to explore. We sense that change had to come to our nation that our people wouldn't continue to accept the inefficient, corrupt civilian government of President Shagari. We were right. Before this film was completed, the coup took place. So our report, instead of being a prophecy, is now an explanation. An explanation as to why the majority of my people, most of whom know what democracy is about, and want it ultimately, welcomed yet another military takeover. I'm not a politician. I'm not an economist. The story I have to tell is a personal one about my hopes and fears for my country. Whoa, 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 whoa. Apart from journalism, I'm a singer. And I suppose this more than anything is my way of communicating my feelings. songs. This one, we're rehearsing, is both a love song and a song about my country. I've sometimes thought of leaving Nigeria, yet every time I'm away, I miss it. Now. Mm. Coming home, though, is one thing. Feeling at home is another. You soon come face to face with the tribulations of living in modern Lagos. Bring it this way. countries, once you pass through customs, you're all right, but not here. is now the most expensive city in the world. It is also one of the most uncomfortable, with its traffic jams, lack of running water, constant park cuts, and the mountains of rubbish in the streets. I mean, to live in Lagos is to live in the war front. I mean, really, I don't know how anybody can, <laughs> can live day after day in that, in that chaotic situation. To live in any of our cities is, 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 is to wage war against filth. We just don't seem to be coping with modernity. There's been a kind of brutalization of life, of values, of man's attitude to man. This so-called rat race to acquire, to consume, to be the next man, that's the acquisition of junk and so on, has created a society that is no longer sure of itself or where it is going. 
Uh, I would agree that the country, the country has gone through a state of moral decadence. It's not only at the top, but also at the bottom. I believe that uh, the society needs a little bit of purification. What people in the street feel is told by the blind singer, Cockerer. His improvisations have always been about the everyday hardships of life. Today, he sings about the meanness and the ugliness of what Lagos has become. And he's right. But this is no reflection of traditional Nigeria. In our villages, the home is still cherished and cared for. After all, it's not as if we're a people without aesthetic values. What has happened to us since our independence? That was 24 years ago, and I had just started school. I remember how proud we were made to feel about it. Nigeria finally had a chance to govern herself. There were high hopes of making it a one united and prosperous nation. But nothing quite prepared us for the difficulties that were to follow. There we were, a nation of so many nations, culturally diverse and thrown together without our consent. In 1967, after a succession of coups and Biafra's attempt to break away from the Republic, Nigeria was pitched into a bitter civil war. At the time, I was a girl of 14, an Igbo on the Biafra side. I helped out in hospitals treating people with malnutrition. I will always carry with me the pain and suffering that I saw around me. It took three years before that conflict was resolved. In the great spirit of reconciliation, largely initiated by General Yakubu Gowan, the then head of state, Nigeria became one again. But the end of the war did not mean the end of military government. During the next eight years, Nigeria was ruled by three military governments, giving us altogether 13 years of military rule since independence. Be faithful and be faithful. It was only four years ago that we got another chance to elect our leaders. So at the age of 27, I had my first chance to vote. Disenchantment soon set in as government officials scrambled for the prizes of office. Corruption was both blatant and pervasive. In the midst of a declining oil economy, individuals made millions, some it is rumoured billions, safely tucked away in foreign banks. Prices of basic goods shot up, while our currency, the Naira, on the flourishing black market fell to one-fifth of its official level. What it meant to ordinary people could be seen in those few weeks before the coup. I sometimes go to Jankara market to buy cloth. Here you can really feel the pulse of the people. Why, why no see me? I de, I de, I de come. Eh? I just want to you see. Come back. I de come back. Oh, I'll finish with you. No, I never finish with you. Get my clothes. It's not unusual for these women to grab their customers, but nowadays there's a sudden desperation about it. Okay. A desperation that I've felt building up for some time. Make I see something. I just don't see how people cope. You can see they're not coping walk down the streets and you see kids and they look like they're mal malnourished. Sometimes my flatmate Tina and I have friends over and usually the conversation comes around to politics. I've noticed a fundamental change in people's attitude. Nigerians are no longer blaming the colonial powers for our problems. Now we direct our anger at our leaders. They know that it's wrong. They can see what's happening. They know lots of people are starving, but they want the money for themselves. They're not interested in how we live tomorrow. Um, when they leave, our generation is going to have to clean up the mess. They're not interested in that. It's take now what you can, while you can. I think it's, it's such a big problem that you look at it and some people feel, well, where do you start? You start by not taking money out of the country. 
They keep embezzling money and putting them in foreign banks and saving up for the rainy day. So if you're so self-centered that you, can't, you don't care about what's going on around you, how can you find solutions? The dividing line between legitimate business activity and what in anybody's language can only be called corruption is not always easy to define in modern Nigeria. Before the coup, this businessman was one of many who enjoyed a considerable degree of political patronage. It was not uncommon for influential Nigerians to have serving soldiers guarding their private homes. This Rolls Royce is one of two that he owns, along with six other vehicles. He operates a number of factories, which like so many others in Nigeria, depend on raw materials. But since the economy has declined, business concerns like his, which operate in planning, textiles and the like, have found it more difficult to pay their way. But the lifestyle of those in charge hasn't changed in the slightest. Sally, Sally, the camera allowed some soft drink. Let me you. I love that. I love it <laughs> yeah. very much. And it's very good. It's been very good. But very, very jealous. Yes. Even if I like the horse, you know, yeah. it was very like among this man's other assets are two luxury jets, which cost a million pounds a year simply to maintain. And thrown in for good measure are two German pilots and a flight attendant. In spite of our disintegrating economy, the number of private jets among Nigerian businessmen has increased. So where has the money to finance this fantastic wealth come from? It sounds bitter, I know, but I think we should be asking these questions. After all, it's up to us Nigerians to make the economy work for all of us. Chief Asabia, Managing Director of the First Bank of Nigeria. This economy here is 90% you know, in Nigerian hands and it's run by us. And um, we must accept responsibility for the way he, it runs or doesn't run. Share ownership of the major industries are all Nigerian now, or 60-65% Nigerian. Not to mention the fixed assets, which is fully Nigerian anyway. So there is no excuse for blaming anyone except Nigerians for what goes wrong. And with our oil, neither can we excuse ourselves like some other third world countries with the fact that we're undercapitalized. Nigeria is a member of OPEC. Fly over the Niger Delta area and you will see everywhere the signs of oil development, both offshore and on land. In the short space of 10 years, the country's income from oil increased 45 times. At the end of 1980, it represented over 90% of Nigeria's foreign earnings. Oil has helped us enormously. I think it has been an unqualified success for Nigeria in many ways. I'm not talking about the management of resources now, I'm talking about what it has done in absolute terms. It's changed the whole place. It's changed our own image of ourselves, our image of the external world. Everything has changed around us in the last 20 years since we had oil. Undoubtedly, oil has brought development. There are everywhere visible signs of this. Motorways, international airports, new universities. With the present world recession, the demand for oil has fallen. Nigeria's oil revenues are now less than half of what they were four years ago. Our politicians have used this to suggest that our economic ills are beyond our control. This is partly true, but a lot of us believe that it is much more due to a gross mismanagement of the economy. I can only quote the governor of the Bank of England one, during one of his visits to Nigeria. He said it is easier to manage poverty than to manage affluence. Uh, the sort of uh, newfound wealth in oil has brought in its trail a number of social problems. We have uh, graft and corruption, uh, inefficiency, because money is easily made. How easily can be seen if you drive through the plush parts of Lagos, 
Ekoi and Victoria Island. Party stalwarts rewarded with even a small plot of land here are made for life. As a banker, I couldn't possibly refuse a loan to someone who comes along and wants to build a house in Victoria Island to let to some company or some rich, you know, rich firm. Uh, the truth of the matter is that three, four years ago, he would have built that house for approximately 100,000 naira, 150,000 naira. He will get 50 years, 50,000 naira by way of rent in a year, and he will get a minimum of four or five years rent in advance. So with the first lot of payment, he's cleared his you know, loans and advances, he's paid the interest on it, and he's still you know, substantially in hand. He can start another house, or he can buy himself you know, a holiday house in Knightsbridge. You know, this is um, it's typical. And uh, in the last many years, you often heard, before the crisis came, you, you, mean, you often heard the gov uh, government officials saying, money is no object. So what happened is that the kind of discipline uh, for planning which was required uh, in government was dispensed with. At the Abara Industrial Estate, just outside Lagos, you see what this has meant for industry in increased production costs. The Metal Box Toyo Glass Company is in the business of making bottles for beer and soft drinks. To be able to offer it, it has had to set up its own radio link because of the inadequacy of our public telephone system. To generate electricity, it has had to build its own power station and also install its own water supply. The international implications of this are explained by the company's chairman, Chief Chris Ogubanja. Uh, uh, deriving from this is the fact that we're never going to be able to produce as cheaply as those people who produce the same products overseas. Chief Asabia indicates another problem with this. This is the kind of econ economy in which it's, you're going to be better off trading than in producing anything, unfortunately. Uh, for example, if you are to set up trade, importing rice or importing frozen chicken about a year ago, you would do much better than somebody who tries to grow chicken or grow rice in the back of his, of his compound. People are not stupid. He's not going to try to grow it if he can make more money you know, by importing it. In order to check this trend and so help local industry, like the metal box Toyo Glass Company, the government drastically restricted the granting of import licenses, but it backfired. Uh, why? Partly because licenses are sometimes given to people who have no connection with the trade. Most Nigerians are aware of this. It is not only the subject of press attention and party gossip, but also a popular subject of satirical drama. Uh, I want you to make it bigger, robust, here at the Peck Theatre in Lagos, there's a rehearsal of a new play that explains the problems a businessman suffers when he tries to obtain an import license. Have you been to the ministry lately? I have, several times. But the minister keeps referring me to the permanent secretary, mm. who keeps referring me to the task force in charge of import licenses, Yo. who keeps asking me to come back every week. Yes, come in. Are you Chief Ayoko of Ayoko Motors? Yes, I am. Um. Oh, excuse me. Uh, they told me at the ministry about you. Yes. I have an import license for 1,000 cars. 1,000 cars? <laughs> yes. And it could be yours if you can pay the right price. But don't you want to use it yourself? <laughs> hey, Mickey, I am not a car dealer. Then how did you get it and I could the right connection and the right party card. I have got the right connections too. <laughs> but uh, you haven't got what I have got to give. <laughs> How much do you want for your import license? 1,000 Naira for every car. That would be 1 million Naira. Maybe you can add it to the price of your car. Anyway, here is my card. Now, wow, what was that I heard? You heard what you heard, my brother. Ah! Bottom power! Right from the top! Hey! The trouble is that this system of making cheap money has become a way of life for some of our government officials. Some people believe that it is their entitlement. This is all what government is all about. And until we can get them to appreciate that that is not the way to run 
a society which uh, is built on order and good government, then we're going to be faced with the danger of uh, the society uh, revolting against this. Since the oil boom, the government has received vast sums of money and it has spent it, not always wisely or even honestly. Look at our new federal capital at Abuja. It was a bold concept done with the best of intentions. The idea was to build a well-planned city in the center of the country, not only to relieve the congestion of Lagos down on the coast, but also to foster unity among Nigeria's many diverse ethnic groups. But reality has fallen short of the dream, even with so much money spent. Dr. Binani, Abuja's supervising architect, acknowledges this. I think as of today, the environment to FCDA is about 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion has been put in here. It, it does not show. Abuja was planned. The implementation has not followed the line of the planning. I don't think in that respect, I think we have not fully learned. It is not a question of who does it. It's a question of who does it well. We haven't done it well. But it's a gigantic project. Moving a capital is not an easy task. Many architects involved in the Abuja project have become frustrated by the way government officials have awarded contracts to the wrong people. There's particularly been corruption in the granting of mobilization fees. This is money advanced to a contractor to enable him to buy materials. And a number of you know, responsible contractors did use this in a sensible kind of way to mobilize, you know, to purchase equipment and material and so forth in advance of getting started. It has since fallen into this disrepute because a great many contractors of the, you know, not so good category have simply not spent the money on the project. They've spent it on something entirely different. A theme taken up in the new Peck Theatre play. Ah, Mr. Preston, you are here. What's the position? Well, a 25% mobilization fee was approved along with your contract. Thank God, at long last. Thank God for nothing. Eh? There is no money to pay you mobilization fee. Look, my friend, what's your soul? Which one you day? Eh? Why are you trying to be difficult? What do you need mobilization fee for anyway? Oh, it's to, to mobilize, to buy the bulldozers, the graveyards, and all the necessary equipment. But you are supposed to have those already. You said so in your application form. The application and what I put on were a mere formality. You know that. Eh? Why? The Germans, the Italians, the French, the British, all these people come here, you give them mobilization fee. Why don't you want to give me two? Is it because I'm in Nigeria? Look, you people expect government to finance your project for you, whereas government does not share your profit. But government is not complaining. I am complaining. Why should you complain? Is it your money? Is it yours? Then what's your problem? <laughs> I have no problem. You are the person who wants mobilization fee. That's your problem. <laughs> so you'll have to find a way of solving it. <laughs> oh, I just remembered something. What? Uh, the 5% inducement fee to speed up the release of the money. Don't cheat. It's 10% payable in foreign currency and you know it. That's what the foreigners pay. Well, that's 250,000 Naira. Well, you have a 10 million Naira contract. Take it or leave it. <laughs> All right. It's a deal. <laughs> Good. See his account. London account. <laughs> now let's get on to business. Nigeria now has a reputation in international business circles of being a place where in order to get things done, you have to offer bribes. It is not an undeserved reputation, but one I think foreign firms have helped perpetuate. It may be difficult to avoid, but their collusion in these corrupt practices certainly hasn't helped Nigeria. I'm sometimes embarrassed when I think of how the foreign visitor cocooned in our extremely expensive hotels must see my country. I wonder if you can ever experience the Nigeria I know and love. I live in Surulere. It's an area that's neither plush nor poor. Here people know each other, greet each other, and have time for each other. It's a place where I can relax and be myself. You 
see, Lagos has become a hard place. Friends are so uptight these days, suffering from the stresses you associate with cities like New York. Exciting, perhaps, but not conducive to easy living. Let's get to work. For the ordinary person trying to set up a business in Nigeria, it's a hustle all the way. There's an incredible pressure to play along with the system. Otherwise, things can take 20 times longer or become impossible. Tina and I encounter this. We've just set up a fashion boutique, our first business venture, and we know how difficult it is if you decide to do it without a godfather, someone with the right connections and the right party card. Um, also, pick up the orange. Oil wealth has concentrated patronage in the hands of government, which of course means the party in power. Since this represents in the minds of most Nigerians a certain section of the country, in this case the north, some people feel they're losing out. They draw waters up country from the rivers. The aborigines upon the banks are left dry in their tenements. Engines upon rigs ulcerate the soil. The aborigines upon the banks may not have their settlements renewed. They cannot even sleep, for flares above woods and waters have so banished their nights. The aborigines, who generations ago kept strangers at bay, can only now keep wake for their rights. The rights the majority of country have taken away in the name of one country to turn waste regions into garden cities. A recent poem by poet and playwright J.P. Clark. He comes from the Niger Delta, one of the oil producing areas of the country, and he knows well the impact of oil exploration on the lives of his people. They feel that they are no longer in control of things, nor do they benefit from oil money. They don't have water, you know, good water to drink, good medical service, no good schools around, no good roads, no, you know, you'll see it all around in the general poverty. And they know it, they cry, they're hungry. Yeah, one gets the feeling, in fact, that uh, those who have political power are daring the people to do their worst. But government is far away from these people. And you can look around you, you'll find that, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> they, everything has been packed away and nothing put back. I mean, now we have to rely on ice fish uh, because <laughs> rivers are dead. They, you know, they, they're dead, uh, you know, from pollution arising from the, from, 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 from the oil industry. Well, how deep is this resentment? Well, sometimes the resentment is so deep that sometimes they wish the, 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 the oil hadn't been discovered. Today in Nigeria, divisions are increasingly on the basis of class, between those who have and those who have not. But there's no escaping the fact that there are still deep tribal tensions in our country. It's something we don't like to admit, according to Nigeria's greatest novelist, Chinu Atebe. We have camouflaged it because we are very good at this, you know, we are very hypocritical. Uh, so we don't talk about tribalism as much as we did in the 60s. We only talk about uh, federal character. We only talk about uh, a catchment area. Uh, these are all phrases which sound to us better than tribalism. What do you think would it take to, to change that around? I always return to the man at the top. I think if the man at the top turned his, uh, his back on tribalism in, in, in a real sense, not, not in political rhetoric, but in his action, then people will see. It's example. It's because the concept of Nigeria has not really uh, taken root. We talk about it glibly. It's just a concept in, in, you know, in the textbook. Uh, what is important is your home village, or your tribe, or your family, or your friends. I understand that. Mama. Although my work requires me to live in Lagos, this is my real home, Arundizog, my little corner of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me will always remain here. These are my people. My life is linked with theirs. 
It gives me a sense of security to know that I'm always welcome here. <laughs> But my home is now threatened. Recently, we've had to move my father's grave and pull down the family house because a federal highway is going through my village. Not that people here are opposed to roads. Of course, we need them. But do we need a federal highway as much as we need health centers, schools, and clean water? <laughs> Things will never be the same again. My uncle, who's dead now, was married to four wives. And according to our tradition, they are also married to me, since I'm a member of the family. So I can expect a lot of pampering when I come home. <laughs> Often I threaten to sack them all if they don't behave. On the other hand, they can come to me with their problems, and often this has to do with money. I'm expected to help out. This family pressure is familiar to so many Nigerians who move to the cities, as we see in another scene from the Peck Theatre production. Here's a telegram for you. Obligations are not just to the immediate family, but extend to aunts, uncles, cousins, and even remote kinsmen. Ah! What is it? Auntie Tola is ill. They want me to send 350 Naira home. So? And what about your new school fees? You promised to give it to me today. This is more urgent. Your brother's school fees can wait. No, it can't wait. It's only 150 Naira. Please, let me have it. Try and be reasonable. I said no! You promised to give it to me today. And besides, the boy may lose his chance for sitting for his GCE if he doesn't pay up by tomorrow. Look, we you can, know that. We can talk to the principal and explain Look, it. Tunde, if you know you're not going to pay, just let me know. Then I'll know your family comes first and mine is unimportant. You know that is not true. Already your nephew John is waiting for you in the other room. John! Your uncle is home. Uh, welcome, uncle. John, what do you want here? <laughs> now, job I can't find, uncle. Papa said make I stay with you for some time. You think it's easy to find jobs in Lagos? Papa say you go help me, care. Okay? After all, I'm a big man. You people will ride a willing horse to death. That was the landlord. He says to remind you that the house rent is overdue. 250 Naira. Ah! Oh, Pario! The obligation to help a kinsman, to take care of one's people, is a real problem for us, particularly when it comes to employment. A great many people have jobs that they cannot do. They don't even begin to understand them. They are in those jobs because they happen to come from a particular part of the country. It's a good thing to have geographical spread and have representation, but it is not helpful to the country. But as people, you know, concerned, if they can't perform. We seem always to opt for the, for the compromise candidate. Uh, not the best. We know, I mean, we have, um, we have three, four, five good people, but the sixth somehow is the one everybody says, you know, let him do it. Because we don't, we don't want to trust A, we don't want to trust B. We, uh, C comes from the wrong place, D is, uh, you know, all kinds of, of reasons. So we end up with uh, the fifth eleven. We play our league matches with the fifth eleven, And so we never win. Consider a public utility like electricity. Lack of cash and growth in demand only partly explains why Nigerians are regularly cast into darkness. Well, more money won't give you light, you see, unless you, you have uh, people who are um, um, competent, who are efficient uh, to run the, the, the utilities. I think this is, we have simply installed uh, a regime of mediocrity. Nigeria Airways Domestic Service is an example of this. 
In most parts of the world, when you're given your boarding pass, you can expect to get on your plane. Not in Nigeria. Here, if you're smart, you immediately try to find the plane you're supposed to board and slip out before the others do and the stampede begins. The only problem is that you're likely as not to be after the wrong plane. So suddenly you're all running in a different direction with the young and the fast-footed leaving the old, the fat and those with babies on their backs behind. Why are you why, 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 What are you doing? You know you've made it only when you're safely on board. Stop! 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 Come here! Come here! Come here. Come here. Where are you from? You say we know. from where, where are you from? From where? From where? I'm from, I'm from Lagos. Lagos? Oh yes. What, what is your duty? Perhaps the most despised of our public services is the customs. Move! Move, move, move. Here officials can become rich overnight, which is why, according to one report, it attracts so many university graduates. Come here! Come on, come here! Come here! Come here! Come here! Come here. Such behavior by petty officials in uniform is not peculiar to Nigeria. What I found peculiar was their not caring what they did in front of our cameras. A group of people are caught smuggling apples and this patrol goes into a frenzy. I wonder what would have happened if they had found something really big. Customs have been the subject of a number of hard-hitting articles in the press. One of our dailies, Punch, recently accused officials of selling the more lucrative jobs to the highest bidder. Customs Public Relations Officer, Mr. Innocent Okoye, was asked whether this was true. Thank you very much for that question. You know, I, I would like to give you a rejoinder to that uh, publication. Yes, yeah. You notice that undue emphasis has been placed on anti smuggling aspect of our job by the press to the detriment of our main duty, which is revenue collection. For the past three years, the customs and the excise revenue has been on increase. For instance, I would like to mention you this figure for the purpose of this uh, interview. Uh, in 1980, we, con we collected 1.7 billion. 1981, 2.3 billion, 1982, and 2.4 billion. Which doesn't seem to prevent smuggled goods from being sold openly in the streets. In fact, these traders told me they regularly have to pay off officials in order to stay in business. Not that some of them have not choice. Nigeria, like the rest of the third world, has experienced the exodus from village to city, and people once there hustling a living as best they can. But Nigeria is a rich country, rich in both human and natural resources. So why do people leave the villages? This village is in the once prosperous cocoa growing area near the town of Abiyokuta. A few years ago, there were over 200 men of working age here. This man has six sons. In the past, it would have been customary for at least some of them to have stayed to help him on the land. It's all part of our present predicament. With oil, there was suddenly so much money in circulation, most of it to be earned in the towns. Farms were neglected, villages abandoned, and those who remained were mainly the old, infirm, or very young. Successive governments, aware of the danger of this neglect in what is still a predominantly agricultural country, initiated one big ambitious scheme after another, culminating in the Shagari government's Green Revolution. My answer to that is that the Green Revolution has given us a lot of food for thought, but hardly any food for our stomach. I mean, it is, it is, it is just another uh, incredible example of mismanagement. Who is in that Green Revolution? Political bosses who don't know yam from cassava. 
who don't know maize from millet. Go and look at go and look at the people who are running it. It's all a way to give money to party supporters. One of the most prestigious schemes of the Nigerian Green Revolution is the River Basin Development Project. The idea is to harness our rivers to a network of canals to carry water to newly cultivated land. Those big projects like the River Basin System contribute in total a small proportion to the total requirements and total production of the country. In other words, they represent only the tip of the iceberg, the base of the iceberg consists of the peasant farmers. Secondly, even the little bit they contribute, the cost is very high. One reason the cost is very high is the disproportionate amount of money spent on administrators in their offices rather than the peasants in the field. When I once covered this subject for television, I found that one official scheme on which large sums of money had been spent didn't even exist at all, except as a statistic on a report. This is how so much of our oil money has been spent, on squandering, embezzlement and neglect. And now with the oil recession, its effect is really being felt, not so much by those with their overseas bank accounts, but by the poor. People on top everywhere tend to be blinded and in Nigeria this is this is almost uh, this is uh, this is unbelievable uh, they don't I believe they don't even know the country it's so easy to become insensitive because uh, the such suffering is always in a corner but if you are in Lagos and you are you're escorted by outriders and all the days of your life you don't see these things and if anybody mentions them you think he's an enemy he's a troublemaker <laughs> All this that you're seeing and all the views that you've heard were recorded before the recent coup. A coup that many see as simply a preemptive one by senior officers to head off a more violent action by younger, probably more radical elements in the army and elsewhere. The people in this country now realize that our leaders only fight for their pockets, not to the, I mean, to the welfare of the poor masses. As an ex-soldier, what do you plan to do about this? I've got some people of my, of my kind of idea, of idea and belief that we have to gather ourselves together and uh, have to, we have to react. I mean, a, a kind of revolution. Now, my fear about that is that something beginning uh, uh, cannot be guaranteed. Some mindless person could take it over and then you will be in an Idi Amin situation. Now, I'm not, I don't, I, don't, I don't want that kind of change. And this is why uh, we ought to fight to bring about rational change through democratic processes. I think, I think we, should, we shouldn't give up on this. I have to keep hoping, being optimistic about Nigeria, because there is no alternative. Would you ever leave this country? No. Never. Uh, this is where God in his infinite wisdom planted me and uh, this is where I intend to live. I'll travel and come back, but uh, I don't think one has a right even to go somewhere else where somebody else has cleaned up. I think this is where the work is and this is where I shall be. Before making this film, I felt like moving to some other African country. I don't feel that way now. For the moment, at least, there's a, there's a sense of hope in Nigeria. How long that would last, I don't know. This country, like the rest of Africa, only so recently in charge of its own affairs, is still finding its way. It's easy to forget that we're trying to do, in a matter of decades, what it took the Western world centuries to do. But perhaps at the moment we're not doing it so well, but at least we're doing it ourselves. And as you can see, not without the ability to recognize some of our shortcomings. The fact that this film was made at all says something for Nigeria. Perhaps it may have seemed too critical in its assessment. But when I go down to Bar Beach, the one place in Lagos where the rich and poor alike mix and come together, and I talk with people, I know many Nigerians share my feelings. Feelings of, of confusion and uncertainty about the way things have turned out since our independence. 
But we hope that this military government can change this and that once they've done what has to be done, will not forget that ultimately it is democracy, our sort of democracy perhaps, that we want. And that that is what we'll demand. We're a very persistent, argumentative and determined people and we'll get it, one way or another. Then perhaps my song, our song, will be a happier one than the one I sing now. Should I? 